Every time the movement has encountered an obstacle, I think the right wing of the movement, the pedicat, which the mons pedicat, they have dithered, they have hesitated, and it's been you know up to the people, the masses of, of Catalans, and up to the to the right and left to move the movement forward. And we saw that clearly, you know, during the first of October referendum, it was actually made possible because you know tens of thousands of people got organized, you know, they volunteered as stewards risking legal persecution and so on, but they went out to vote in their millions, we don't know how many actually did it, and, you know, they are the ones who, who paid for it, you know, being attacked, being beat, beaten up, and so on. So those are the people we have to look at when we look for hope, not, not the maneuvers taking place above. It's not that we want to do this right now, it's that we have to, to protect our rights of the language, which is a, a treasure for everybody, of women, of LGBT, of our class, working class, which is the majority. And there's now a huge gap, isn't there, between the top and Puigdemont and the, and the people below and the movement from below. And you see, I think the thing that we can really take hope from is that that movement from below is beginning to develop a real class character. The fact that trade unions, workers, people on the streets is giving it a left-wing class character. And I think we should be hopeful because the crisis for Ahoy will not go away. And we have to hope that the movement on the streets, the movement that's developing a class character, strengthens itself for the battles to come. Because you need to have control of the economy, control of the territory, and, 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 and general control of the country if you want to be taken seriously. And we haven't done that. We declared independence, then we fled to Brussels seeking the miraculous help of the EU, which will never come. So we, we made a mistake here, because the Mons made a mistake, but thank God we have people in the streets who have their, their eyes wide open and they are seeing what's happening. And whatever it happens, this is shaping a generation. And if we win this battle, it will certainly lead to other battles to be, to be won in other countries. Just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Nadia. I'm a student uh, at Queen Mary and also an activist. Um, and I've been getting involved in the stuff that's uh, Solidarity, um, I mean, sorry, Catalonia Solidarity Action Group has uh, been um, holding. So that starts with the public meeting just before the referendum, the demonstration held it outside of Downing Street uh, following the referendum, and the public meeting today. Um, for those of you who are new, uh, Solidarity, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, I keep saying solidarity first, that's the first thing in my mind, solidarity. <laughs> um, yeah, Catalonia Solidarity Action Group is a network of activists organising solidarity meetings and protests around two basic demands. Uh, so that is that we reject the Spanish state oppression and we support the Catalan people's right to decide their future. Um, and the aims of this meeting really are to raise awareness about what's happening, uh, debate different perspectives and really to discuss what we can do uh, from here to uh, demonstrate our solidarity with the people in Catalonia um, in Britain. Um, so yeah, to introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, we've got Hassan Hopp from CUP England uh, and uh, they are a, the anti-capitalist uh, pro-independence left in uh, Catalonia. Um, just to uh, introduce really how the meeting is set out, each one of our speakers is going to speak for five to eight minutes and then we'll have room for questions and contributions at the end and the speakers will sum up. So um, please do think about things you'd like to raise or questions you'd like to put to our speakers. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, um, I'll pass over to Hassan. Good evening everybody. Um, so I'm here representing a group called Coop England, which is sort of semi-official currently branch of <coughs> the group, which forms part of a bigger group which is Coop in the Exterior, which is an official uh, branch of the Coop, which brings together uh, obviously people, um, members or supporters of the Coop who live outside of Catalonia. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here speaking and it's really amazing to see uh, the number of people that are really getting interested in the Catalan situation and the organisations and the different proposals like Catalonia Solidarity Action that are, that are coming out um, to find ways to bring people together to build solidarity for what is happening right now uh, in Catalonia because um, I think that it really should be at the top of our agenda right now as, as internationalists as people and organisations um, who spend our time thinking about and are committed to uh, bringing about political and social changes from a leftist uh, perspective. Because what we're talking about, as I'm sure um, 
most of us and all of us know is organised civil disobedience right now on a massive, massive scale. And we can look back just a few years uh, to 2012 and the coup were calling for disobedience and saying that the only way that um, we're going to be able to break free from the Spanish state, the only way we're going to be able to respond to the Spanish state is through disobedience. And at that time they were um, considered radicals, idealists, just a few people making some noise. Today, 2017, we're seeing 2.5 million people go into the streets to vote in a referendum knowing that it was illegal, knowing that potentially they could have <coughs> charges for taking part in the referendum. With hundreds of thousands of people staying outside the voting centres to, to block them, to protect them from the potential actions of the, of the police, knowing that the police had already come in and just beaten up and, and smashed the faces of a lot of people. And still today, we've got hundreds of thousands of people that are continuing to, to organise rallies, protests, in every little town and neighbourhood across the whole of Catalonia. And of course yesterday we had another general strike, which was not supported by the main trade unions in Catalonia. But still, because of the level of organisation and, and mobilisation that there is right now, I managed to bring much of Catalonia to a standstill across the whole day. This is a growing movement. This is a growing movement and importantly, it has a very significant anti-capitalist and left-wing uh, component. And this, is gaining, <coughs> this element of the movement is gaining more and more influence every single day. And the changes that could potentially come about from this, the changes that are already coming about, in fact, not only have the, the potential to bring long-term changes to, to Catalonia, but also, as I'm sure we all agree, um, have huge potential to bring changes <coughs> across Europe and, and even further afield. <coughs> I'm not an expert on the history of the coup, I'm not an expert on the internal struggles of the coup, uh, I don't claim that in, in any way. I'll just mention a few things just to say what the coup is about from, from, from what I've lived and why I see it as such an important and interesting political force. The coup is the electoral platform for the, the left-wing independence, or what's called the left-wing independence movement in Catalonia. And importantly, we can talk about sort of two fundamental goals for that movement uh, in a broad sense. The first is social transformation, and the second in no, in no order, and the second is independence for Catalonia. There can be no social transformation without independence, but there can be no independence without social <coughs> transformation. They're both fundamental elements to what the movement's about. <coughs> and inside the group, you do have individual members, but importantly, you also have grassroots political organisations that make up uh, the coup. And what this means is that, for many inside the coup, the fight inside parliament is just one part of the struggle. The fight on the streets is seen as just as important. And that is a fundamental feature of what the coup is all about, and that's what makes it so different from so many other political parties. On a personal level, um, I got involved in Catalonian politics about uh, six years ago, um, living in a small town just outside of Barcelona. Um, I was involved in the camp 2012 um, campaign when the coup first entered into the national uh, Catalan parliament. Many years before that, I've been um, involved in uh, local elections and local political structures. Um, and I was just back again recently uh, to, to support a referendum back to the same town and for the general strike. Um, just two things that I wanted to quickly uh, mention because it comes up a lot when I talk about uh, Catalonia, when I talk about the independence movement, and particularly why it's important uh, from a left-wing perspective. The first is about um, Catalan identity, um, which I'm sure comes up when, when we talk about um, Catalan politics for a lot of people. One thing I think that is really important to recognise is one thing that was made clear to me very quickly when I, when I got to know Catalans and Catalan politics was the strength and, and the presence of a very uh, shared common history uh, amongst Catalans. Um, of course, there are some who don't share this same history, but most reasonably informed, most minimally politically engaged um, Catalans, whether they support independence or not, have this shared history very present. 
And of course, you know, part of that history you can point to some very important elements. The the fact that the in in, in seventeen fourteen on eleventh of September, another day, another great event for eleventh of September, as well as the Twin Towers and and, and Sour Agende, eleventh of September seventeen fourteen was when Catalans lost uh, ultimately their political autonomy after military defeat to the Castilians. This is very present in the minds of Catalans. And also very present is the reality of the Franco era. The fact that Catalan as a language was illegal, Catalan culture uh, was suppressed. And the reason I'm talking about this is because I think whether we think it should be an important issue today or not, it doesn't really matter. What is really important to recognize is that this is how many Catalans see themselves today, and this is how many Catalans understand the history of, of their people. And the existence of this, uh, you like, Catalan consciousness is, is an undeniable reality. And I think a lot of the policies from the Spanish state, uh, whether it was to legalize the referendum, whether it was to refuse to respond to great demands of autonomy, these things that try to deny that reality, ultimately all they do and all they've done is increase the support for independence. The second issue I just want to quickly touch on is the issue of nationalism. Again, in this country, I'm sure when we talk about independence and Catalan independence, people, even on the left and on the left, will say, oh, it sounds a bit nationalist for me, you know, I'm not getting involved. What's really important is that, and what's really important in the, in the independence movement in Catalonia, particularly in the left wing independence movement, is a differentiation between supporters of independence and supporters of nationalism. It might seem just a semantic uh, thing, independentistas or, or, or nationalists, but uh, there is a real material uh, difference. And in my time being involved in Catalan politics, uh, I've seen that, being involved in the independence movement, I've seen that. And, and I can explain it in this way. Um, in all my time, anyone in the independence movement, whether in the left-wing independence movement or in the mainstream, they've never spoken about Catalans being better than anyone else. They never speak about hatred towards other groups. They never talk about exclusivity. You know, and of course, so many Catalans, even those in the front line of the independence movement, have grandparents, parents from outside of Catalonia. This is not what the Catalan independence movement is about. These negative connotations that come with nationalism aren't associated uh, with um, the Catalan independence movement. We've got about one minute left, so I'll just quickly um, drift by a few other points that maybe I can bring up later. But just to say to finish, I just want to um, mention the CDRs. In Cuba, we all know the CDRs are the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. In Catalonia, in the lead up to the referendum, these groups were built and they were called the Committees for the Defense of the Referendum. And they have been formed in towns and neighborhoods across Catalonia to initially defend the referendum, to hide the ballot boxes, hide the papers, work out how to bring them into the voting centers on the day, and to make sure there's people at all the different voting centers to protect them throughout the day. But they've continued to grow, and they're continuing to um, be a fundamental force and a growing force in the ongoing resistance. So they bring together long-term activists from the left-wing independence movement, but also many other people activists of a more autonomous nature who maybe hadn't been involved in the Catalan question previously, family members, people who might have just gone one protest before, and their mates in the bar. It's a very big movement. It's a very exciting time. There's a massive grass movement, uh, grassroots movement in motion, which is very organized and very connected at a local and a national level. Just to finish, and this really is to finish, the chair told me she's very tough, so I'm trying to be strict for myself. There are two uh, slogans that became really um, common and became a big sort of shout during the, the referendum and the aftermath. One of them was, uh, these streets will always be ours, and the other one was, um, we're not afraid. And I think every day right now in Catalonia, more and more people are really believing those slogans. And that those two things are happening is really powerful uh, from the perspective of potential change in Catalonia. So now is the time to get behind what is happening. Now is the time to do whatever we can from our organisations, on an individual level, in our trade unions, in our political parties, to get maximum support possible for Catalonia. Thank you very much for the space. Thank you for the time.
So Julie Sherry is an activist who in the past was involved in the campaign for Scottish independence um, and in fact recently travelled to Catalonia, to Barcelona um, and sort of witnessed and experienced what was happening there. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to pass on to Julie. Okay, thanks. Well, I was just on the tube on the way over, uh, picked up a copy of the Evening Standard and opened it and put it on the page. And the two headlines were, one, Prime Minister too weak to get ministers she wants, and the second one, this government bent on self-harm and unforced errors. And I thought that was quite an interesting way to look at, you know, <coughs> locating what happened in Scotland in the referendum as a part of a process uh, where really we're seeing the most spectacular crisis unfolding at the top of the British establishment. Um, because just like uh, the, the election this year, uh, the general election in 2015, where we saw the rise of Corbyn, we saw the Tories fail to get a majority, just like the Brexit vote in 2016, where we saw a lot of people rejecting what the establishment uh, were trying to sell to them, the, the Scottish uh, independence referendum at the end of 2014, I think was very much part of the same process of you know, working class people really kind of mobilising and rejecting uh, the programme that was coming from the top of society, and it was an anti-establishment uh, vote that we saw taking place there. Um, and you know, really you saw a situation where the Tories went into the referendum thinking that they had the whole thing in the bag, and they came out of it really bringing the thing right to the brink of almost losing the election, an incredible sense of desperation from the top of the British establishment in the last few days building up to that referendum. And like, when you think about what happened in the mobilisation around the Scottish referendum, I mean, there's lots of differences now in the way that things are playing out with Catalonia, but there are similarities. I mean, it looked exactly really like what some of the images we've seen of Catalonia, the mass mass movements of tens of thousands on the streets, people getting organised inside communities, holding big meetings where working class people are part of a discussion um, about what kind of society they want to see. This was very much what um, the Scottish independence movement looked like. Um, really it was like the whole, whole society discussing politics in a way that you know, we hadn't seen and this was you know, very shaped by an anti-austerity uh, agenda as well. And you know, like in, in Spain, we had the same arguments we had, uh, the Better Together was the, the name of the sort of coalition of all the forces that were rallying to defend uh, the unity of the British state as it was put. Um, and you know, really the, the official campaign had nothing really positive to put. Uh, their line seemed to be the status quo is all you can get and you should fear everything else that might come. Um, but we also had an argument on the left, which I think is similar to what we've seen around Catalonia, which is saying that to support the independence campaign is about you know, dividing the working class across the borders and that this is something that actually is not a position that socialists should be um, supporting, which I thought was, uh, you know, in reality it didn't really make any sense because you actually had a situation where south of the border lots of working class people were cheering on what they were seeing taking place uh, up in Scotland. Um, you know, I think at one point there was even a, a claim that they wanted to have a Newcastle independence movement and so on, but I think this was part of part of a process where people were looking at the Tory government in Westminster and saying they're getting out, we want out as well, you know, so I think that it, it's utterly wrong to characterise the movement as a narrow, you know, nationalist uh, movement. It really represented the class-based rejection of austerity. And it's really interesting, some of us were down on a, on a protest a couple of weeks ago that um, was uh, Hello Catalonia, Hello Social Justice and all the kind of slogans that were a part of that really reminded me of the Scottish referendum uh, campaign because it wasn't about, you know, I mean, actually lots of people did wrap themselves in the soul tire, but it was because they identified that with the way to beat back austerity and to have a society that welcomed migrants and was against war and all these kind of things. And I think that that's a very similar thing. This was the same feeling inside the Yes movement that it was about change inside society. Um, and so, you know, that moment where the SNP started, the Scottish Nationalist Party started to pitch their campaign much more along the lines of defence of the health service, no to cuts, all these demands the support for it really surged and, and you could see, you know, voter registration was at 97%, <coughs> turnouts were absolutely huge, 70, 80% of, of people were turning out to vote. There was one, uh, this would probably sound familiar to some of the protests in Catalonia, one pro uh, polling station that they actually had to shut uh, halfway through the day because already 100% had voted, uh, that could vote at that polling station. So what you can see is obviously like a mass involvement of working class people in this process. Um, and the areas that had the biggest yes votes were the working class areas, um, which I won't list because most people probably won't have heard of them anyway, but, but you know, <laughs> if I went through them, that would make a point. <laughs> um, so, you know, huge, huge <coughs> working class communities and the establishment absolutely on the run. I think Ruth Davidson, the head of the Tory party, actually said at some point, like, oh, if you're just voting no to get us out, we probably won't get in anyway at the next general election, so don't just vote no if you're against Tories. I think, oh, this is really, really desperate stuff. 
obviously three years on, I mean, people still have the yes posters up in the windows, people still wear the yes badges, there's still a sense of that representing, you know, <coughs> against the Tory establishment and, and wanting a different society. Um, but there's been a whole process, I think, playing out in Scottish politics that's been quite fascinating, really, that if you look at it as a bit of a microcosm for, I think, lots of discussions and debates and ideas that are playing out inside um, society right now with the scale of turmoil that we see in the world. <coughs> so you look at this year's uh, general election, and, of course, the Labour Party had taken a pro-union position in the referendum, kind of decimated itself inside Scotland, lined up with the Tories. It hasn't recovered from that process at all. Um, and we see a landslide victory to the SNP in 2015. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, been, it's been really a majority in the government um, off the back of articulating that anti-austerity, pro-migrant, anti-war agenda. You know, come a couple of years on to this year's general election, now the SNP still won the election, but they lost half a million votes, which in Scotland is, is quite a big deal. It's not, it's not a huge country. And, you know, I think for a lot of people, the kind of shite, the, you know, the gloss of the SNP had come off, having seen SNP councils putting through huge cuts, you know, having seen, uh, you know, backtracking on various positions. And I think a lot of people really felt that they hadn't delivered on the promises that they'd made. Um, you know, there's also the whole question of uh, how the, the Brexit vote played into this as well. Um, you know, they, actually a third of the people who voted yes, people might be surprised to hear, <coughs> for Brexit. Um, you know, that a lot of people split away from the Labour vote and voted Tory. With all, all kind of processes taking place inside uh, that election. But really why did the SNP lose? They lost because they made big cuts in the councils. Um, they sort of put off pushing forward the process of a second independence referendum um, and you know right now it's, it's a similar situation playing out where you can see a real tension for the SNP coming up because um, like Barcelona the whole flags and people's windows was a big part of the movement and as I said the posters are still up for yes. There's a lot of other flags appearing around uh, in Glasgow in a, in a noticeable way, I don't want to overstate it. Um, Catalan flags, people in Glasgow are putting up Catalan flags in their windows right now um, there's uh, a whole tension playing out because a whole bunch of the Scottish ministers in the Scottish Parliament have put a motion to the Parliament demanding that the SNP take a position to recognise Catalonia. Now, Nicola Sturgeon, head of the SNP, doesn't want to recognise uh, Catalonia at this point in time because she's terrified about what that will mean for relationships inside the EU. And obviously this is a situation where she's heavily pushed uh, a pro-Remain position, but actually a lot of the base of the, you know, the, some of the more progressive base even of the SNP's uh, social base uh, was pro-independence, pro-Catalonia -Catal and, uh, you know, anti-EU on the basis that it's, of all the bad things that it does. Um, so this is, this is all where we are right now. I think um, what's interesting about it, just to finish up, is that there's a, the, you know, there's an awakening, I think, around the Catalonia question inside, uh, inside Glasgow and inside Scotland right now. Um, lots of people are pointing out that the line that the SNP are putting that they can't possibly recognise it because it's a foreign affairs issue and that's a Westminster issue. Well, they recognised, you know, Palestine a few years ago, which was a really positive precedent to set. Why can't they do it again now over, over the question of Catalonia? Um, but more importantly, in a way, I think it's a, it, it's a you know, mobilising solidarity over what's going on in Catalonia inside Scotland as well as inside Britain is actually going to tap into huge layers of people who are looking at the world around them and thinking, you know, both they want to stand and mobilise solidarity, but they want to fight in the anti-austerity and anti-racist movements here. And it's actually, you know, to see the incredible mobilisation of working class people in that battle is a really huge inspiration and really underlines, I think, if you watch every moment in the process of both what's happening in Scotland and what's happening in Catalonia, that really is mass mobilisation of a movement from below of workers organising that's going to take uh, one in real change. Speaker is Carlitos, who is from the Basque Pro Independent Radical Left, um, and he's going to talk about uh, the implications of the events in Catalonia uh, for the Basque country, but also uh, the movement that's happening over there. Um, so, yeah, Carlitos. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak in this meeting. I will do my best, but first I would like to say that I know an expert, so don't expect much. What I have done is asking for help. And I will read a statement on behalf of AHA Mildew. Um, the Basque Independent Left has had different political institutional expressions over the years. Currently, AHA Mildew is the Basque Progressive Left pro independence coalition and it is the second political force in the Basque country. As some of you may know, the Basque country has undergone a complex big protest. Since 2010, the, the pro independence left has opted for a democratic and peaceful struggle. Aneta declared in 2011 
the definitive cessation of this arm is hunting the, the speed of the opportunities the Spanish government has tried to handle and block the process. The government even refused to discuss ETA's disarmament, which finally happened with activity with active participation of Basque civil society. The government attitude has been especially harsh on Basque political prisoners who have been held as a political hostess and who had has measures applied to them, despite the end of the armed struggle. During all these years, we have supported the people of Catalonia and their struggle and have respected all the decisions. We consider that there is no possible agreement with the Spanish state without a very deep reform, and such reform seeks, not, seeks to be impossible. There is no option for third ways, no possible agreement with an state that can only work as a victor of conquerors with no option or room for any other possibilities. In the current situation, we will get support in the Catalans and oppose the application of 155, which we consider a good attack against democracy. The, imp the imprisonment of the members of the Catalan government for such crimes of rebellion and sedition are an absolute disgrace. We may not be surprised, as we had already so far, the legalization of persecution by the Spanish state. We can't stand aside. No one can. Catalonia needs our support and solidarity. We have support Catalonia in the streets. Over 50,000 people took part in a demonstration in Bilbao in November the 4th to oppose Article 155. We have asked institutions to support them. Our activi activists an elected representative were in Barcelona on the 1st of October. We need to win international solidarity and so the Catalans do not stand alone. Finally, we believe that the best way for us to support the Catalans is opening a second front for independence in the Basque country, both in the institutions and in the street. Thank you very much. Um, who is a Catalan activist in London and a member of the SWP in Hackney. We are seeing now um, how the pro-independence movement, it was portrayed as the wealthiest region in Spain wanting to split from uh, the, other, the rest of Spain for economical reasons. It was portrayed as a nationalist movement led by the Catalan bourgeoisie, etc. This, this is nonsense. It is nothing like this, and day by day it's been proven that it's nothing like this. The pro-independence movement is a movement with a wide range of political ideas, but that was pushed from below, and it was pushed from the left. And ten years ago, only the CUP and a few so-called radicals were pro-independent. No one else was pro-independent. And the conservatives, they became pro-independent when the group, when the movement was so big that they didn't have any other option but to join the movement or to die trying. So that's first. Second, the pro-independence that the conservatives had dreamt of, they dreamt of a soft transition from being part of Spain to being a separate country. They dreamt of um, uh, having um, fully recognition from other countries, from the European Union, etc. And, 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 and more importantly, they thought that the movement would be led by them and it would lead to what they wanted. They are seeing that this will never happen. It will never happen. We, only, we will only achieve independence if we do revolutionary struggle and if we bring, if we bring the struggle to the streets. And the Catalan people, they, they, you know, they, they're changing in this process, and we are all changing, and we've seen, seen, we've seen things that most of the people thought the state wouldn't be capable of, like brutally assaulting peaceful voters. I mean, we've seen the violence and, and repression that the state uses when they are challenged. And, 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 and we have half of the government in prison, and the other half in exile, in, in Europe, you know, in 2017. So, so we had the king pointing the finger at us and, and, and dividing the Catalans between good and bad Catalans. I mean, we've seen absolutely everything in, in, in a couple of months. This has been incredible. And this is opening people, people's eyes. And people are organizing and they're defining the powerful. 
and, 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 and they've been in the streets and they've been shoulder to shoulder with other people and, they, and they've seen oppression from above and solidarity from below and, and, and this is amazing and I can tell you I have plenty of friends that they, they've changed completely. One guy said to me, um, people are asking me what, what happened to the apolitical guy that I was. Well, he died the 1st of October, right? He died under the patterns of the police. So, um, so the pro-independence movement is now working on its own. It's, it, doesn't need, uh, it doesn't need the main political parties to steal it. It doesn't need the main unions to steal it. Uh, it's just working on its own. And events like the general strike that we had yesterday, that as, uh, as it was mentioned before, it was organized by, by the CDRs, the, the, the Committees of the defense of the, for the Defense of the Republic, um, those, um, those, uh, those um, things that are happening, that are being organized by the people, is a clear example of, of, of what, where the movement is going to. So this is, a, this is really a key moment in the pro-independence struggle. Because people are realizing, and it's pretty obvious, that we are not going to get any recognition, um, any recognition from other capitalist states. We are going to get it, and, and, and we're not going to get it from the EU. And, and, and all the options that, that puts the monarch uh, is pursuing, they're running out. So at this point in time, what we need to do and what really, what really can push the pro-independence movement forward is disobedience, and is organized workers' action and started resistance, and, 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 and this is the only way we can implement the Republic of Catalonia. There's no other way we can do this at this time. And, and, and in my opinion, um, the movement at the moment is, is, is lacking of political leadership. I mean, Puigdemont declared independence, that's fine, uh, but he didn't implement it, right? And he is running out of options, he's buying time. So, so uh, the, the ANC and the Omnium, the grassroots organizations, they seem to face the same direction. So there are other things coming up. People are organizing and the CDRs are taking the role of the revolutionary organizations. They are, they are, they are organizing uh, action and response to the Spanish state. And, and of course, this is a very complicated moment and we need, we need solidarity from everywhere. But I, let, let me say that, that we need solidarity, but we also need to give solidarity because this is a two-way process. Because we are living, and, and, I, and I mean that the Catalan people and the Spanish people who are living now in this country, uh, we need to show solidarity to, to the people who are living here. We cannot ask for solidarity and not give solidarity to other people. That's really important. And it's as well important that we get support from the rest of the Spanish state. Because, I mean, this is going to help everyone in the Spanish state. If we can bring the regime down, if we can really break the Spanish state, and if the Basque country follows, and we can, we can, we can re get rid of it, it will be, it will be, uh, it will be uh, an amazing outcome for everyone, for all working class. So we need to engage people in Spain, and we need to be careful with the terms that we use. The Spanish state is not the Spanish people. We are not against the Spanish people. We are against the Spanish state, and the Spanish people are our brothers and sisters, and that is really important. And the anti-racism and the anti-fascism needs to be always at the forefront of the fight for independence. It needs to be there. We cannot fall into traps and generalizations about Spanish people. We, the Catalans, are not better than anyone. We were just born in Catalonia. That was random. We are people of the world and we need to be united all. And, and we need to avoid calling all the unionist fascists, because they are not all fascists. They are, there are fascists between uh, inside the unionist movement, but they are all not fascists. They are people who just believe that independence is not the best option, like like the uh, like the Spanish left. They don't see independence as we see it. But independence has to bring a real change. If we don't get rid of capitalism, if we don't get rid of the EU, we will not have this change. We will not have. They won't let us have it. They won't let us have it. Some people say, oh, you're putting up a new border. Are those people in favor of free movement of people? I mean, those people who talk about borders all the time, oh, you're putting a new border in the world. Well, uh, capitalism doesn't understand of borders. You know, we are the 99%, the poor people of the world, and they don't give a shit about, about borders. So, uh, 
So it's time for solidarity, it's time for organized action and revolutionary struggle, and it's time for us being more internationalist than ever. We cannot build this on our own, and it, it cannot stop only in Catalonia. It needs, to be, it needs to be something that triggers other revolutions and more changes in Europe and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. If you talk about the fascist state, you know, as a fascist state, basically what we are saying is that Spain is some kind of deviation from the European norm. And I don't think that's the case. In fact, what we have seen is that all the French, the German, or the British government have fully sided with Rajoy and supported his actions. And the European Union institutions have had a very similar you know, reaction, um, mildly criticizing Rajoy, but in essence, saying that you know, they trust his leadership to deal with the crisis in a democratic way, which he has shown not to be you know, capable of, of, of doing. The second point is I think the last speaker was completely right to say that right now the movement lacks a clear leadership. Because if you look at the dynamic of this whole process since it began, what you see once and again is that um, you've got you know, a very strong movement in the streets, mobilizing millions of people, and a leadership in the institutions who, once and again, have tried to control it and, and you know, uh, put limits to it, but because of the intransigence of the Spanish state, once and again, you know, going ahead with the movement has meant breaking with, with the framework of, of, of the Spanish constitution, Spanish law, and so on. And you know, every time the movement has encountered an obstacle, I think the right wing of the movement, the Pedecat, Puigdemont's Pedecat, they have dithered, they have hesitated, and it's been you know, up to the people, the masses of, of Catalans, and up to the, to the right and left to, 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 move, you know, to, to move the movement forward. And we saw that clearly you know, during the 1st of October referendum, which was not made possible you know, by the smart maneuvers of the council and government. It was actually made possible because you know, tens of thousands of people got organized. You know, they volunteered as stewards, risking legal persecution and so on. And, and you know, they, 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 finishing, they, you know, they went out to vote in their millions. We don't know how many actually did it. And you know, they are the ones who, who paid for it, you know, being attacked, being beat, beaten up, and so on. So those are the people we have to look at you know, in, in, when we look for hope, not, not the maneuvers taking place above. It's not that we want to do this right now, it's that we have to. To protect our rights of the language, which is a, a treasure for everybody, of women, of LGBT, of our class, working class, which is the majority who supports the whole country. So because of that, it's now. And we tried, and we are tired of the constant aggression of the government. That's why, you know, we want it. We must do it now. It's not that we want it, but we have to, I think. No volen ser una regió d'Espanya, no volen ser un país ocupat. Volem, 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 volem la independència, volem, volem, volem països catalans. EU and all the different leaders in there, but I think people are also right to talk about Puigdemont because, of course, uh, anyone facing repression demands our full solidar solidarity. Anyone who's under arrest, of course, we are in full solidarity with them. But we do have to raise the questions that actually the predicament he, he is in is down to a lack of strategy. Uh, he put himself at the head of a movement for independence and didn't have a strategy to break with a Spanish state, and that therefore he risks demobilising the movement and there's now a huge gap isn't there between the top and Puigdemont and the, and the people below and the movement from below and you see I think the thing that we can really take hope from is that that movement from below is beginning to develop a real class character. The fact that trade unions, workers, people on the streets is giving it a left wing class character and I think we should be hopeful because the crisis for Ahoy will not go away. He's at the head of a weak government which, let alone on this issue, has to push for austerity <coughs> and so on. And we have to hope that the movement uh, on the streets, the movement that's developing a class character, strengthens itself for the battles to come. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Thanks everyone for um, a brilliant discussion. Um, before I bring the speakers to come back uh, and summarise, which they'll do in about two or three minutes, uh, 
between two to three minutes. Um, I just want to call on somebody from uh, Catalonia Solidarity Action Group, Alesh, to make an announcement. <coughs> yes, so if you, or all of you have a small leaflet down your phone, you can take it, please. So, basically, this Saturday, 11th yeah, of November, so this Saturday, at 3 p.m., we are organized, we, we, we organized a, a protest um, against repression um, for the freedom of the Catalan detainees. Yeah? So, you're all welcome to come. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everybody you know to come. Every single person counts a lot, yeah? The 3 p.m. in front of the Spanish Embassy in London, which is uh, like five minutes walk from uh, Hyde Park Corner, yeah? Spanish Embassy London, Google Maps, 3 p.m. Saturday, all right? All right, so I'd like to welcome our first speaker back, uh, Hassan from Coop Exterior. Um, that's again. Oh, wait, that's it. Um, <laughs> there's just so many comments and things that I was trying to write things down and then it was chaotic. I've got two minutes, well, only one and a half minutes left. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I just think the first one of my reflections that maybe responds to a lot of things is that we have to remember that the Spanish state is extremely powerful. It's not just the Rajoy government, again, an argument you can use against the discourse of Podemos that says if we take away Rajoy, everything will change. We're talking about the courts, we're talking about the police, we're talking about the press, and then of course we're talking about the power that is international community, the international states, the European Union, wherever else. So I can understand uh, an anger towards Puigdemont, and I'm, I'm speaking it completely on a personal level, yeah? Um, but also I recognise that what was going on around the time of the referendum was extremely complicated, complicated, no, extremely difficult. I mean, very difficult to work out what the right thing to do was, you know, if, if you were in that position, because the pressure to not declare independence to, from, from sort of the middle row people, your, your Barcelona in Comun, the Adekalao crew, the Podemos crew, was also massive. Um, so I don't know, I was personally not sure what I would have done at that moment, but the coup always had it very, very clear that they would have declared independence in that first opportunity and started making um, steps towards a uh, constituent assembly. And they are always in times of uncertainty, my, my reference points, because I totally support and believe in, in their structures and their politics. Um, Will it demobilise people with to and fro in, you know? I, that is definitely a huge fear and I was very worried about that, you know? I, I, I'm happy at least in the end it was really important that independence was declared. Um, in some ways it might be advantageous that it was done in that way because no <coughs> one can use the argument that they did it too soon. But I don't know, I mean I really can just say I just don't know if it would be better in terms of mobilising to have that at the beginning or at the end. As I say, the coup had it very clear, and I completely support that, but it's a very, very difficult situation. But also we have to recognise who Pedekat, the Puigdemont's party, is. You know, we can't forget that. We know that very clearly. Puigdemont might be in the, the, the better side of that party, but it still is a, a right-wing party that ultimately has nothing to do with, with, with what we're all about. And the left-wing independence movement has that very, very clear. It's independence from the Spanish state, but it's also independence from the Catalan elite as well. And they are just as much an enemy um, when the time comes. Um, just to say, again, breaking away from a state is not easy. Breaking away from a state is powerful. The Spanish state is obviously going to be very, very difficult. It's going to be a very, very long game. I think we've all got to prepare ourselves uh, from that, the left-wing independence movement, it has growing power, has important power, but of course it has very limited power. Um, so also it has to, uh, moving on to the elections, respond to different scenarios that are thrown at it, because the left-wing independence is in, is in control of, 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 of everything that happens. So what's doing the elections? I don't know, there's going to be an assembly this weekend where the coup will decide its position on the election. Um, I think if all the independent supporting parties hadn't stood, it might have been a good strategy on their own. I don't see it uh, so clearly. All right, I'll finish up. Um, I just want to mention something good about Podemos, and then and this last point, is that okay? Okay, go yeah. for it. 
Thank you. Um, because I think they, 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 Tom mentioned about the, the, the people across the, the Spanish state, and of course there's a billion different opinions. Um, we have to remember the level of manipulation in the Spanish state media is phenomenal. I mean, it's absolutely incredible. Um, but there have also been huge shows of solidarity um, everywhere. But I think the case of Podemos, apart from what their political ideology might be, um, it does show how scared they are of showing any kind of indication that they might be even slightly uh, open to the idea of Catalan independence. They've been so afraid of that, and that many of you probably have seen the, the conflict between Podemos in Catalonia and, and Podemos HQ, and the head of Podemos in Catalonia, Fachin, wanted to talk potentially to the uh, independent supporting parties for potential coalitions. And Pablo Iglesias took away all his power, and he's basically been forced out of the party because he was so um, fearful of that. So we've got to appeal to them, them more as much as we can, but also it's, 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 we've got to recognise the reality of the political situation. You know? There's been a clear moment to take sides in something. I think it's a moment where you have to take sides because the, the conflict is so, so big and they um, haven't done it. You know? And we know in those moments, ultimately, you end up favouring the status quo if you don't take sides in my uh, very humble opinion. Um, so just to finish, and completely sum up, I promise, um, United struggle in Spain, would it be better? Don't know. Classic question, you know, is it possible? Don't know. You know, it would be fantastic. Of course it would, would but what has already been said is what exists right now, you know? What is happening right now? And the Spanish state is shaking, you know? And that's, that's a real thing. And that's a result of the, the Catalan independence movement. So, of course, the questions and debate and reflections are really important. We've got to keep doing that. But we also have to get and do everything we can right now to support that struggle. As I've probably said a billion times already today. Thank you again. Yeah, somebody mentioned towards the end of the discussion um, that in these moments where you have moments like this emerge, you can see the sort of the nature of the social forces in, involved, and I think that's quite a, a good way to look at it when we think about you know the questions facing activists and say Catalonia are coming up. I mean, the lesson from Scotland, I think, which is obviously there are big differences in the situation, was really as somebody mentioned, like you know we had the the referendum in 2014. At the end of 2014, we had the general election in 2015 and really it was a bit of a tragedy that the left was on the one hand divided but also there was a huge pressure you know if you think about the huge numbers of people that were so enthused and excited by the independence movement and felt the need to rally behind the Scottish Nationalist Party it wasn't just that the left was divided it was also that you know they essentially people had the argument that we will lend our vote to the SNP and so what happened was a process where already uh, you know, the SNP was, was mopping up all, all these um, new activists who were enthused by it. The left kind of really weakened its, its chip at the table and said that process. Um, and I think this was a real problem because when you look at the social forces involved in that situation, really you can see played out over the last three years how the SNP uh, essentially is, is pro big business, is pro capitalist, you know, wants to build a capitalist society. It's never going to be able to. Um, straddle that, that sort of you know, tension of trying to deliver for the working class people that it knows it needs to mobilise to, to, to win, but also for big business of what it represents. And so I think the fact that the left kind of weakened itself in that situation was, was a massive mistake. Now I don't know tactically what the right answer is inside, the, inside Catalonia, but it's, it's a question to definitely sort of remember in a general sense the lesson of making sure that the left keeps a, a, a level of independence and fights for its own strategy. Um, and yeah, uh, it's interesting because obviously Jeremy Corbyn as well, as Nicola Sturgeon has not come out and fully supported um, Catalan independence in the way that we would have liked to have seen um, under his own pressures really connected to Scottish independence because, um, you know, because of the pressures to hold together the, 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 and inside the Labour Party and conciliate the sections of the right. And I think that's a real mistake and underlines again the need for, for independent socialist organisation really. Um, but somebody mentioned the question of the state as well and I think that, you know, the key thing really is for the left to not just orientate on what our strategy is inside the upcoming elections, but actually to really, really build inside working class communities and to mobilise campaigns that are connected to the demand for independence, but also tying it into all those kind of anti-austerity, anti-racist, you know, uh, demands that are that people are mobilising over because there's been such a huge mobilisation going on, and really what you'd want to see is a kind of socialist left 
growing and, and becoming um, more effective about that process. Um, all right, next I'm going to welcome back Carlitos. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you. Um, the gentleman in the corner mentioned timing. Timing is because it was about two things. In 1978, Spain became a democracy. But all the system, all the structure of the state was fastest. From the crown down, from the royal family to the courts to the police, nothing changed. Nothing changed. In fact, you go <coughs> uh, torture uh, people who was uh, in the army or in the police, <coughs> torturing, uh, torturing, sorry, doing torture to political dissidents, become politicians. And they are in court and they are in parliament. So basically, the problem is nothing changed. And Catalonia has said, stop. And Catalonia got the chance, we had the chance with Catalonia, to have that domino effect. That could be going to the Basque Country, could be going to Valencia, to Canarias, to Asturias, to, uh, to Galicia, one after another. And someone mentioned about relation between different parts of the country. That relationship, it has to be decided by the people of that countries. Valencia should decide, I want to join a commonwealth or a republic, or I want to go on my own. The Basque Country can do the same, Catalonia the same. It has to be the people of the old the East country. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what will happen on the 21st of December, but already there are right, uh, politicians talking in the newspapers telling that they, if the Republican win the elections, they will apply the Article 155 again, and again, and again, and again. So basically, nothing has been changed. It will be a democratic election? No. It will be uh, changes in the system? No. Because we need to stop and, and demolish these structures of this state. <coughs> that has to be done by every single part of the country. Valencia, Asturias, Catalonia, Andalusia. I got one minute. <laughs> About Europe. You don't have that like uh, the three monkeys. I don't see, I don't talk, I don't hear. <laughs> All right? It has done nothing. The problem is monkey see, monkey do. Today they do in Catalonia, tomorrow they will do in, in Scotland, or they can do in Germany, in Italy. No problem, because we have the same thing. It happened in Spain, it happened in Catalonia, mm -hmm. nobody is saying nothing, we can do anywhere. Mm -hmm. So this is not about talking about one fascist state. We're talking about a friendship of the states that look to the side when something goes wrong, or mm -hmm. they're against them. So it's not the job of the Catalan people, it's not the, that they could be the first one, or open a second front in, in the Basque country. It has to be open a third front in all Europe. So in London we start, we can go all everywhere. But it's not only the job of one country. Catalonia is not alone. It got friends <coughs> in the Basque country, in Europe, and you are here. So work together. So uh, a lot has been said, but um, I mean, most important, I think we are trying to break up with a, to break up a state, or to break up with a state, and a state that is not only parliament, a state that is formed by the judiciary, by the army, by the media. It's a big, it's a big thing we're trying to break up with, and we are 20% of their cake because Catalonia is 20% of the GDP, and, and they don't like that. They don't like it, and they will do whatever it takes. And you can see what's happening. All the political parties, despite they're in the left or in the right, they set aside their differences when they have to protect the state, because the state is the cornerstone of everything. They have to protect it, despite their political ideas. They come all together, and they look to the other side when we are beaten up by the police. And and this is why uh, we are facing difficult times and obviously it's not, it's not easy and it's not going to be easy and it's not going to be pretty and we're not going to you know, go along and declare independence and everything will happen smoothly. We have declared independence but we have not implemented it and this, this is a big mistake.
because you need to have control of the economy, control of the territory, and, 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 and general control of the country if you want to be taken seriously. And we haven't done that. We declared independence, then we flew to Brussels seeking the miraculous help of the EU, which will never come. So we, we made a mistake here, which the Mons made a mistake, but thank God we have people in the streets who have their, their eyes wide open and they are seeing what's happening. And whatever it happens, this is shaping a generation. This will change everyone's mind. This will shape the future of Catalonia. We will be a left country and we will take all of this into account in the future. And if we win this battle, it will certainly lead to other battles to be, to be won in other countries like, like this country. It will definitely be something really positive in terms of getting out of this austerity EU and moving towards a better country uh, and, and, and a better world. So thank you.